Matthew chapter 12 is where we're going to be this morning. Uh, everybody noticing a few changes around the building, right? So uh, make sure you're aware of that. Um, the uh, the logo, 3D logo in there was really Tammy's idea. Outstanding. Did a super job on that. And then the, uh, the sound booth was uh, uh, Dave's design along with uh, Rex and Kai and those guys. And so um, things are kind of moving forward. So, and Dan, is, uh, Dan Reeves is here. Where are you, Dan? You're here? Is he here? Security. security. Dan's on security, and he uh, he's in the process of building that. So uh, let's be sure we express gratitude to those guys. James Ellis, by the way, won their game uh, Friday night. They're on to Baker uh, as a number two team in the in the rankings. So we can uh, pray that our good friend James will win a state championship. That would be like way awesome for him. And uh, even though he's from Days Creek, right? We can say that here. He's from Days Creek fans here. Right? I mean, okay. All right. All right. I know. I, I, he's a good friend. All right. Um, years ago, um, when I was in Bible class, at a Bible doctrines class, our professor got up and he gave this example about the importance of understanding the reality of Jesus and his, his portrait to us as his people. And here's the example that he gave us. There was a guy that wanted some direction from the Lord and needed a sign from God on what he needed to do with his life. So he decided that he'd take out his Bible, and because he believed it was the, it was the Word of God, and anywhere it landed... He committed himself to just go do exactly what he read right off the bat. So his Bible fell to uh, Matthew 27, 5, which speaking of Judas Iscariot says this, and throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed, he went and hanged himself. To which the man thought, okay, that can't, that can't be right. Um, so he just decided to do it again, flipped it open to Luke 10, 37, which then read, you go and do likewise. <laughs> now as we say from the pulpit, context matters. It matters, right? It matters to that. We all know the story of Judas. We all know the story of go and do likewise. It's about following what Jesus has instructed to us. But we also know something else that's dangerous in that story, is that we have a tendency to go into God's Word or go into other areas looking for external signs that will say something to us about God, about His faithfulness, about His love, about whatever. And this morning, here's what my hope is. My hope this morning is that we will see, we will appreciate, we will understand, we will believe with all of our hearts that Jesus is it. That Jesus is it. That's my hope. My hope this morning is that we will see that this morning. That's what we're going to see in the text we're going to be in. We're going to see that Jesus Christ crucified, risen, and alive is the only and the greatest sign from God that He loves us, accepts us, approves of us, provides for us, cares for us, and that's all we will ever need as far as signage. We don't need anything else. We don't need another proof text because Jesus is it. It's also a sign that God is holy, just, and righteous. And it is the sign of the reality of Christ. And so we're going to see this morning... There is no need for another sign. Jesus is it. So let's stand together. We're going to read Matthew 12, 38 through 45 together. Then we're going to pray. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. When the unclean spirit had gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but it finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also it will be with this evil generation. Let's pray. 
Father, we, we as humans need the eyes of God to be able to see what you say because you're God and this is your word. So would you open our eyes to let us see as you see the reality, the power, and the wonder of Jesus. Help us to see that Jesus, Him crucified, buried, raised, and alive is the only sign that we will ever need. There's no need for another. So Father, help our human hearts. We, we, want, we want more. Help us to be satisfied with Christ because He is it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being seated. You know, maybe at some point in your life you've had one of those discussions with God. You know, things are kind of rough. Maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you have thought to yourself, Lord, if you will just do, and you name it, you know, whatever. Give me that job. Um, make this girl say yes. Um, you know, provide some money for me. I will give my life to you and serve you the rest of my days. Right? Martin Luther did this, only he did it with, with St. Anne when he was in the middle of a thunderstorm, afraid of his life, and he said, St. Anne, if you will if you'll keep, 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 keep me safe, I will go to the monastery. And that was the beginning of Martin Luther getting into a monastery where he eventually got confronted with the doctrines of grace and led to his salvation that eventually sparked the Reformation. All because he made a deal with St. Anne, right? We make those same deals as Christians, but we say it differently now. Instead of saying, Lord, I'll believe in you, we say things like, Lord, would you just once again, because I'm discouraged, I don't feel your presence, would you just once again prove to me your faithfulness by healing my child, taking away this sickness, doing this miracle. Prove to me again that you love me by doing something for me and that sign becomes something that we begin to center our hope upon. And then when it doesn't happen, we begin to doubt and have struggle with if the Lord really exists. My hope this morning is this. Here's what I want us to do. I want to center our hope and our thinking and our appreciation on the greatest and only sign that we will ever need. Because it is, it is so... It is so vast and so full that we don't need anything else. When we begin to see the reality of what Jesus Christ has done as the risen Savior. I want to tell you this morning that you don't need another sign. I know that probably some of you in the room are wrestling with discouragement, maybe depression, maybe fear. And you're worried that what you have believed all these years may not be true because of certain external things are happening around you, and you are groveling in the night for these types of signs. And my hope is this morning for you that you will see that there is no other sign, no greater evidence. You don't need anything else than Jesus Christ and Him crucified and raised that reveals to you the reality that you have a God who loves you, has forgiven you, is with you, and cares for you like no one else in this world. That's, that's the goal this morning. That's where I want to go this morning. So let's start this journey by looking at verse 38 and looking at those who are seeking out a sign. We, we once again come face to face with these people called the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes were like the lawyers of the Jewish faith. They were the ones who were the experts in Jewish law and Jewish traditions. And there's been this rising conflict in Matthew 12 about the Sabbath day, about all the rules and regulations. <coughs> And what Jesus can and can't do on the Sabbath. So they bring in the experts. The experts randomly show up and they, they begin to ask Jesus to prove himself again. In a sense to say, show us that you are the king, that you are saying that you are the king. Now just for a moment, let's remember just what we've seen just in Matthew 12. In Matthew 12 at the beginning of the chapter, we are confronted with Jesus Christ healing a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath day. The Pharisees saw it. Then we're confronted with a man who is demon-possessed. He can't hear. He can't speak. And Jesus delivers this man of these demons and then heals the man to such a degree that he can speak and he can hear. All of these Pharisees and these scribes have observed 
those things. And what their observation was, this man, Jesus, is doing this because he's the son of the devil. To which Jesus, as we talked about last week, refutes that and says, no, look, that me doing these things reveals something really clear. It reveals I'm not the devil. Matter of fact, it reveals I'm stronger than the devil. And reveals that the kingdom of God has been inaugurated right in your midst, and you can't even notice it. And you're calling the things of the Spirit of God, the things of the devil, and you are in deep trouble. And Jesus confronts them clearly about this to just tell them, you're missing it completely. Yet here they come again. Jesus, give us a sign that will prove to us the very things that you're saying. Now, let's put in context what he's saying, what they're saying. What they're asking Jesus to do is they want him to do a sign on demand. Right? You know what I'm talking about? A miracle on demand. So Jesus makes something up, figures something out, and just call it out. And if you do that, we will then believe that you are the Son of God. Now, if I'm Jesus, I can think of a lot of miracles I would do to prove to those guys that I'm the Son of God. One of them might be disintegrate the guy who's asking the question. And I'll go, okay, that's a pillar of salt. He's dead. Anybody else who wants to rebel? Who wants to do this? But Jesus does not do that. Jesus does not give in to their sign and demand because he has a reason for it. They want Jesus to conjure up a miracle here. Let's, let's just put this in our modern vernacular. They're wanting Jesus to act like a circus performer. They're wanting Jesus to put on a dog and pony show. They want Jesus to do something that they demand of him that will then prove to them that this is indeed the Son of God. We'll name the miracle, you do the miracle. They want him to prove that he's the Son of God by giving some sign on demand. Now we know from the text that Jesus did not do that. We know that he did not conjure up some magical trick. He didn't, they didn't call something out and, you know, kind of, you know, Jesus didn't do, okay, pick a miracle behind which number door, and I'll open it, and then I'll do that miracle. He didn't do any of that type of stuff. Rather, what he did was he didn't, he just said something about it. He didn't do any kind of miracle. Now we can ask why. Why did Jesus not do a miracle in this moment? Why? Why does he do it in other moments, right? Because we know that he can. We know from reading Matthew that he's calmed the seas. He's healed the sick. He's raised the dead. This isn't because of an inability to do a miracle. So why is he not doing this sign on demand for these arrogant Pharisees? And I think in this we can see one reason for this and one application I think will help us. And one reason is this. Signs are not given to the proud in heart, nor are they given to the face of faithless for a reason of proving a point about God's existence. We must understand that. They're not given to sensation-seeking people. They are given to the humble. They're given to those who are submitted to Christ for the point of glorifying Christ. Signs are not for us. You have to understand that. They're not for us. They are not for sale, and they're not done on demand. They are a mercy. They are a gift from our Heavenly Father to us as His children. Listen now, as an extension, as an extension of His love and care from His promises and His faithfulness. They're never given. Never are they ever given that God might prove Anything to us. That's one reason why Jesus didn't give a sign on demand miracle. But there's an application in this that I don't I think we don't I don't want us to miss. And it really is something that will help you as you navigate through life, sharing the gospel, living in the church, and understanding how the church, in my opinion, should function and how we should function in the world. Because what you're gonna notice is this. Are you aware when you're reading this? This tells us that the previous signs that Jesus had given, I mean, we can name a few just in our 11 chapters of study in Matthew, these miracles that Jesus had done, the Pharisees that had their eyeballs wide on these things, those miracles were not enough. You're aware of that, right? Not enough to the point they got to come and they go, hey, show it, do another. Do another. This will prove it for us. And you know what this says to us? It tells us the nature of of the human heart. You, you, know, you know this heart really well because you're human, right? This is where Paul would say, I'm speaking to you in human terms. You ever wonder what else other terms Paul speaks in? Do you speak in like alien terms? Do you speak in, you know, speaking, what kind of terms? You, 
So you gotta think of in human terms. In human terms, I'm gonna attract your heart, talk about your heart, and here's what we're seeing. The human heart naturally, naturally, always wants something bigger and always wants something to be proven again and again and again and again. Right? I mean, you do this in your own marriages periodically. Sometimes, maybe it is not for you, but it is for me. Sometimes if my wife isn't home when I thought she was supposed to be home at a certain time, I kind of start beginning to wonder, where, where is she? Who's she talking to? Who are the people she's around? I mean, if, did some like good-looking dude show up? And what's the deal? Where's my wife? What is that? That's the human evil heart wanting her to prove again she's faithful. She's done it time and time again. Why do I need her? She said I do. Isn't that enough? The human heart naturally does this over and over and over again. What's happening in the text? These people want Jesus to deliver a sign of the man miracle because, and Jesus does it. Why? Because he knows this. The human heart is never satisfied with those types of miracles. It's never satisfied. He could have done it, but it's never satisfied. These proud scribes, these proud Pharisees are never satisfied by the miraculous signs that he's, that he's done or that he will do. They still won't be satisfied. They want Jesus to prove himself again and their sign-seeking hearts will never be satisfied. That is so important for us in the church. So important for us in the Christian life. And here's why. We have a tendency to believe that in order to be faithful in gospel ministry, we have to be like super elite force type of Christian, right? You know, talk about like Navy SEAL Team 6 Christian, that's who God uses, and they're the ones that blow things up, they go do frontline work, they are the bad of the bad, and i got to be that person, and if I'm not that person, therefore God will never use me because He's going to use this extravagant, big thing. Sometimes we think that God will only use the greatest preacher. Or God will have to use the perfect housewife who has everything in order. Or He's only going to use those, those builders that everything that they build gets put on a magazine cover. We have this tendency in our mind to think that God expects us to put on this big show. You know what we see from this text? God isn't looking for dog and pony shows. He's not looking for circus entertainers to advance his gospel. He's not looking for the big extravagant sign on demand. You know why? You know why? Because the human heart always wants more. So here's what you have to kind of get in your brain. This is what you have to kind of get into your brain when you're coming to church here. Here's how we think. Because we think this is the Bible. What you draw people with is what you have to keep people with. So Jesus did a big sign on demand miracle. What are those people going to gravitate to? The big sign on demand miracle. So they're going to keep coming for more of those signs over and over and over again. What you keep people with, what you draw them with, is what you have to keep people with. In other words, if people were drawn to Jesus by these big magical events, he's got to keep doing them. And if we draw people to our church by a big excellent light show, a wonderful entertaining experience, a big movie cinema type experience. Guess what we got to do next week? Got to do it again. And then what happens if the power goes out? Uh oh. We're in trouble. Right? Because people by nature will always seek for more. That's what happens. But Jesus shows us something incredibly different. Something incredibly different from the rest of the world. See, the scribes and Pharisees would have done a sign of a miracle, but not Jesus. He shows us something totally different. Here's what he does, though. He doesn't just say, I'm not going to do any sign, does he? No, he didn't do that at all. He says something fascinating. He says, I'm going to show you a sign that is so fulfilling and so satisfying that you will not need another sign. Whoa. I don't know about you. I want that. Because I know the nature of my human heart. Always needing something bigger. I need something so satisfying that there's no need to look for another sign. That's what Jesus does in verses 39 through 42. Because now he shows us the only sign that's needed. And Jesus gets right to the heart of the matter here. He tells these guys, listen, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. Now, I don't know about you, that cuts real quick into my heart when I begin to think about the moment
moments where I might have said to the Lord, hey Lord, just one more time, would you just show me again that you're faithful? Would you just give me another sign, another reason to believe? Right? It just cuts down deep. These people were evil because you know what they're doing? They're demanding of God to do what they ask of God. In a sense, they're saying to God, you do what we tell you, then we'll believe. They want God to be a divine bellhop. We ring the bell, you answer. They're adulterous because here they are calling themselves monotheistic people, worshiping the one true God, yet they are demanding their God to do that to them. And do that for them. But notice the sign that Jesus says will be given them. And will be given all. He says this, no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and nights in the heart of the earth. Here's what Jesus is saying. Jonah, if you know the story, was a prophet of God. He was called by God to go preach to the Ninevites. But there's a big time problem. Jonah hated the Ninevites. He hated them. So he decided to jump on a ship and go off to Tarshish. As he's going to Tarshish, that ship about capsizes, and all the sailors say, okay, somebody on here brought us some bad luck. So they all draw straws, and Jonah draws a short straw. So they toss him overboard. Just before he is drowning, a giant fish swallows him whole. And Jonah is three days and three nights in the belly of this fish until it finally spits him up on the land, just short of Nineveh. Guess where he goes? He goes to preach in Nineveh. The Ninevites have a big revival. Jonah gets depressed because he hates those people. He's mad that he repented. And the whole story ends with Jonah being angry at God. Why did that happen? Why is Jonah in the Bible? Do you know the beauty of your Bible? It tells you what Jonah was in the Bible. Because he says, just as if Jonah were three days and nights in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be. In a sense, the reason for Jonah is revealed in the life of Jesus. Jonah is what we call a type. He's a forerunner of Christ, and here's what he is. He was there in the belly of that fish, three days and nights, just like the Son of Man, Jesus, was three days and nights in the heart of the earth after his crucifixion. Then after three days and nights, Jesus was resurrected from the dead, just like Jonah was resurrected from the belly of this great fish. Now what's intriguing is, this is the first time in the book of Matthew that we are introduced to Jesus talking about his death and resurrection. Now, we're looking back from history. So what do we know? We know that Jesus is talking about his death and resurrection. Because we got the vantage point of history. But imagine if you're the Jewish people in the first century hearing this. <laughs> this would be a little confusing. Okay, wait a minute. Okay, so Jonah, we know the story. Three days and nights, belly fish gets spit out. Okay, I got that. The Son of Man in the heart of the earth. We don't get that. What are you talking about? Why are you revealing this? Now, we know from the vantage point of human history that Jesus is forecasting. He's prophesying of something to come. He's pointing ahead to the greatest sign that God is going to give that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. Remember, what are they asking for? We want a sign to prove you're the Son of God. Jesus basically says, hey, fellas, it's coming. And when it's coming, it's coming in a big way. And here's what it's going to look like. It's going to look like Jonah. Remember Jonah? Yeah, we do. Well, the Son of Man is going to go into the heart of the earth, and he's going to get spit out as well. And they're shaking their heads wondering, okay, what in the world is he dealing with? Jesus is saying this. The death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead, listen clearly now, is the, capital letter, the sign that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It is the sign that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So here's what Paul said in the book of Romans, and we know this because the Bible says this. He says that Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead. See, when God raised Jesus from the dead, here's what He's doing. He is approving and showing us that when Jesus rises up, everything Jesus did in His life and His death, God is completely satisfied with. Most of us know the verse, the wages of sin is death. Here's a question. 
What's the wages of a righteous life? It's eternal life. Well, if Jesus lived a righteous life, why is he dead? He has to be made alive. He has to be resurrected. It is God's way of saying, I approve of everything he did in his life, and I approve of his death. That his death was a substitute's death, not for his own sin, but for the sin of others. Therefore, when Jesus gets raised from the dead, what does it prove? It proved that he is indeed the Son of God. The resurrection is the proof, the sign, the evidence that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Apostle Paul would tell us later that, listen, without the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, we are fools to believe in Christ. Fools! Because the resurrection proves something about Jesus that is so radical and so unique and so satisfying and fulfilling to the soul because nothing else can beat that. But Jesus isn't just talking about a sign. See, he's given us a sign. He's telling these guys, there's a sign coming. It's going to look like resurrection. That's going to prove I'm the Son of God. I don't have to play your silly dog and pony show game right here. We're coming upon a day when I'm going to rise from the dead, and that day you're, you're going to be amazed at what you see. But Jesus isn't just talking about the sign. See, this is what's fascinating. Jesus in this text is a bit cryptic. He's a bit cryptic with these guys. Just like Jonah... That's what the Son of Man is going to be. But he doesn't say what's going to come like he does later in Matthew 16. Because notice what he says after this comment about the sign of the Son of Jonah. Of the sign of Jonah. In verses 41 and 42, he says this. The men of Nineveh would be their judges. Because the Ninevites repented at Jonah's preaching. Yet the current generation wouldn't listen to the one who's greater than Jonah. Or he uses another example, the Queen of the South. You know, you know from the Bible, the Queen of Sheba. She went up to visit Solomon. She traveled a huge distance to go hear Solomon's wisdom. She will be their judge because she listened to Solomon. But the current generation would not listen to one who is greater than Solomon. What Jesus is saying is really clear. Because he's greater than Jonah, when he preaches... They should listen and they should submit. When, when because he's greater than Solomon, we should not only travel a huge distance to hear him, we should get everything we have to follow him. His greatness is proven not by signs on demand, but by his future resurrection from the dead in that moment. For us, his greatness is proven not by signs on demand, but by his resurrection from the dead. This statement by Jesus is a judgment. Are you aware? He's judging right now. He's judging these Jewish leaders. And he's saying to them this. Eventually, when he's crucified, he's going to be crucified by who? By these very Jewish leaders. Sure, the Romans are going to nail him to the cross. They're going to stamp him there. But they did it because the Jews demanded that to happen. The Ninevites, what's fascinating is when he rose again from the dead, what's going to happen then? He's, he's going to say in resurrection, I've judged all of you. My resurrection is a judgment that you did not believe that I'm the Son of God. Can you see now the sign of Jonah? What's fascinating is this is why he says the Ninevites would rise up in judgment. What did the Ninevites do? They heard the word of God preached and they repented. They didn't need a dog and pony show. They didn't need a circus entertainment. The, the, the Queen of Sheba, the Queen of the South, she, she simply heard that Solomon had the Word of God and the wisdom of God travel a huge distance to go see him and hear him. We should as well spend a fortune to do the same things. Yet these scribes and Pharisees, in their arrogance, in their sign-seeking minds, could not bring themselves to see how superior Jesus is to all others. See, Jesus is making a point about his greatness. He's making a point about his superiority. They, they needed something that would prove this to them again. Now let's just take a moment to take some stock in this process. See, maybe you're here this morning, maybe you're watching online, you're listening, and maybe you think somehow that if God will do something miraculous, you will believe in Him. I had a guy years ago say to me, listen, dude, I hear you. I understand what you're saying about Jesus, but here's the deal. I will not believe in God until He comes and sits down right here in my lap and tells me He's God. I said, well, that, that would be, that'd be really bad for you. Yeah. Right, really bad for you. 
And you hear it at the heart of it. I want God to prove something to me. Listen, if you're here or you're listening, here's what I want to tell you. If Jesus Christ's death and resurrection on the cross is not enough to prove to you that He's the Son of God, that little miracle you're looking for won't be either. It won't be either. Just like these scribes and Pharisees, you want Him to do a sign on demand miracle, He's not going to do it. Because He's already given you a sign, and it's a sign of Jonah. Jesus Christ is all the Savior you need. He's all the Lord you could ever want. Because He has not only died for your sins, He has been raised again from the dead, and He's the only one that can offer you all the forgiveness you need and all the hope you need to make you right before God. So the best thing you can do is, is listen to the, to the words of the Ninevites and the words of the Queen of Sheba when they say, listen and repent. Turn. Trust in Christ. That's the best thing you can do. Because another sign is not going to prove it to you. Or maybe, listen, you're here as a Christian. And you, you're, in that part, you're in that mode, right? I mean, listen, if you grew up in a Pentecostal realm and ultra sign seeking realms, that's part of the challenge of the signs all the time. We have to have things falling out of the sky to prove to us that God exists. You can see why that's remarkably dangerous. Because we get in this mode that nothing is ever good enough, there's got to be more to it, and we don't rest in this beauty. Jesus Christ and Him crucified and raised is all the sign you need. See, maybe you're just begging, God, show me your love again. Show me your kindness again. Prove to me that you're faithful once again, that you're with me. I feel like I'm, I'm in a desert place. But friend, listen, I just want to draw your heart for just a moment to the fullness of what Jesus has done and what God has proven through Christ for you. Just think with me for a moment what the gospel says. The gospel says that God, there's nobody, nobody in all of the universe, in all of human existence that criticize you and can criticize you more than God. You know what the, you know what the gospel says? The gospel says that you are the worst sinner that God knows. Ooh, man. The sooner you understand that, the sooner you realize that, the sooner you understand and appreciate the wonder of this glorious gospel. It tells us something about our hearts. Our sin deserves the full separation from God forever. Yet in the same moment of God criticizing us, that same God, through the death of His Son Jesus, is saying something else. No one is approving of us or loving of us or accepting of us or caring for us more in all the history of the universe or the history of time than this God Himself. In other words, God, there's no one that will love you like God through this work of the gospel of Jesus. This means you will never and will never be loved like this. It's greater love than you could ever dream even though it's the worst criticism you will ever have. That's fascinating. All the love you'll ever need is found on the cross. All the forgiveness you'll ever need is found on the cross. All the mercy you'll ever need is found on the cross. All the friendship you'll ever need is found on the cross. All the counsel you'll ever need is found on the cross. All the provision you'll ever need is found on the cross. And because of God's great love for you, because of Jesus, you know what that means? It means that He will never, ever leave you. And there is nothing in this world or the next that will ever separate you from the love of God found in Christ Jesus. But it also means something else. That if God provided for your forgiveness of sin, which is your greatest need, right? You're aware your greatest need is to be forgiven of sin. It's not what you're going to have for lunch later today. Your greatest need is forgiveness of sin. And if God provided for your forgiveness of sin, which is your greatest need, through the same act of Jesus dying and being raised again, God promises to meet your little needs like food and clothing. You're aware of that, right? In the same work. So, in a sense, God providing for your needs is not God showing you that He loves you. No, it's a fulfillment of the promise He made of the gospel. It's a fulfillment He made of the cross. That's fascinating news. And you're aware as well, right, that if you, in the same act of Jesus' death and resurrection, that God gives you all the power you will ever need to stop sinning and live for His glory. 
right? You know that. You know that, right? I mean, you know that all that anger that you struggle with, that jealousy that you have, the thing that you just go, I can't stop. Why does it keep taking hold of me? You're aware, right, that in the same work of the gospel, Jesus Christ living, dying, and being raised again from the dead, that God, when you believe in Christ, deposits His Holy Spirit in you and gives you the Spirit of Christ's power to no longer obey your old sinful actions. Remarkable power. And that Spirit of God, then what does He do? He draws our heart to God. He's our Father. He reminds us of the truth. And He points us in the right direction. See, by one act, Jesus' death and resurrection, three days and night in the heart of the earth, God has provided everything we need so we're no longer looking around for God to prove Himself to us again. He's already proven it. It's already done. Now, does this mean that God never does miracles for us? And the answer is no. He does do miracles for us, and He does them sometimes pretty regularly. But here's the point. He doesn't do miracles to prove His love for us again. That's totally unneeded. It's unneeded. He uses miracles to do what? Make us marvel at God. Draw our attention to His bigness and His greatness. To see our smallness and recognize our need for Him. Miracles are unneeded to prove that God cares for His people. The gospel is all you need. Jesus is it. His death and resurrection is the only sign that you need to prove that God, Jesus, is the Son of God. That's it. No more. So when you start feeling that wrestling back to your soul, right? You, you know that moment. Man, Lord, could you just, you know, today I just, I just need it, Lord. Here's what you do. You go back and you say this. Lord, I, I am the worst sinner I know. My sin deserves the wrath of God. And today... I am standing before you as a free, forgiven, righteous individual because of Jesus. There is nothing that reveals your love like that. Nothing. And today when I start wrestling, wanting another sign, would you just take me back again to the resurrection, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus again? Just take me back there again. That's why, church, you've heard us say a hundred times over through the years, preach the gospel to yourself in every way and every day. The gospel of Jesus is all that you need. Now you might say, okay, I'm hearing you. I kind of get the idea that Jesus is the Son of God. <clears throat> but here's the deal, man. In order to believe this God, i gotta, gotta, I got to get my act cleaned up. You've heard people say that. I've got friends that, that I know of that I'm talking to them about Jesus and I'm invited to the church and their comment is, you know, i, I got to get a few things kind of settled first. You know? I'm like, no, I just come as you are. Maybe just, you know, whatever. Well, I, you know, I don't know, I man. People kind of know, I know me there. And, like, great, just come. Then. Just come come as you are. Right? Just come, be around us, hear the gospel. I'd love to have you come. And they just kind of, you know, they want to get cleaned up first. Well, let me just let's give a caution here. Because, because one of the dangers is we'll say to ourselves, let's get all cleaned up without Jesus. And Jesus says something about this in this passage. Notice what he says in verses 43 through 45. And it's a strange text. And it's just kind of out of the blue, right? I mean, just when the unclean spirit has gone out of, out of a person, it passes through one of places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I'll return to my house from which I came. When it comes, it finds a house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last day of that person's worse than the first. So you can feel the, the challenge. The challenge is, okay, look. I see that Jesus is the Son of God. I see that He is. I see that He's the King. I see He's inaugurated the kingdom. I, I got to get myself cleaned up to be able to serve Him. And we miss something, right? We miss something. And here's what Jesus is basically telling us. He's telling us that 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 there is a danger in attempting to clean yourself up without making Jesus the Lord of your heart, right? Now, that's what He's kind of getting at. He's basically laying it out. He's doing it in a couple ways. Notice in the text, he says that when the unclean spirit leaves, it then returns, and what does it find? It finds this house empty, put in order. Everything's okay. It's got good morality to it. The home is clean, but it's empty. There's no Lord, no master overseeing that house. And what this tells us is Jesus is talking to these scribes and Pharisees. He's talking to us. 
That we might see something. That we might see that Jesus is superior to all others. That we might see that his signs point to the fact that he's greater than all others. And we might think, just, just got to get my house in order. Just get my house in order. I'll, I'll remove all my evil demons. I'll remove all my evil sins. I'll get them all out of my life and put them back and even feverishly try to clean up ourselves a little bit and get it in order. But here's what Jesus says. He said, that's completely futile. Because what does that evil spirit do? It returns, finds an empty house, does what most of us would do when we're college-age kids. Hey, got an empty house. I got some buddies. Let's go party. And it brings seven other buddies to go party at this empty house. And they have a big old celebration. And he says, the last state is worse than the first state. It makes things worse. Rather, what's the point? The point is this. We should submit to Jesus as Lord. We should see that he is the king. We should submit ourselves to Him because we know that He's proven to us that He is the Son of God. We should give ourselves wholeheartedly to Him, if you will, have Him be Lord of our hearts. We should submit to Him. We should give in to the fact that He's superior to all others, that He's greater than all others, that He's bound the strong man, and He's come not only to clean our house, He's come to captivate our hearts. That's what He's come to do. And when that happens... Guess what that unclean spirit does? It sniffs around the outside of the house. It sees it's occupied by a Lord, and it moves on somewhere else. <clears throat> now, here's why we've got to get this. There's a last verse, part of these, this verse, that is terrifying that we can't miss. And Jesus says this, So it will be with this evil generation. Hmm. Now, he's talking about the people he's talking to. So what is he getting at? Well, here's the question. What do you know from the book of Matthew alone about this evil generation? Well, here's what we know about. We know they go from bad to worse. Right? We know that they were fair samples, so they had a lot of traditions and rules, and they cleaned up their houses, and they had a, a <coughs> real dangerous morality without the lordship of Christ. And what they did was they went on rejecting Jesus to the degree... They plotted to kill Jesus. They put him in a twisted trial where he was an innocent man underneath all the, the, the laws of Judaism and all the laws of the Roman Empire. And they begin to say things before the Roman Empire that to think that, that you come out of your mouth tells you how evil these people were when Pilate says to them, listen, I'm innocent of this man's blood. And they reply, well, then his blood be on us and on our children. They, they, this isn't just people in Matthew 12 talking about Sabbath day. These are people saying, listen, if he's the son of God, then let all of his curses, all of God's curses, fall on every generation we ever have. Now that's, that's evil, friends. That's evil. They went from bad to worse. They, they went from just simply having a small debate to killing a man and then asking for his judgment to be placed upon them. Now listen, their example is one that we should heed. Because here's why. Friends, we don't need another sign. I mean, these, these scribes and Pharisees are begging for a sign, sweeping their houses, making them clean. All the while, the king has come. They don't want him in their home. We don't need another sign. Jesus is it. We don't need another proof text. Jesus is it. We don't need other evidence. Jesus is it. We don't need to get our lives in order before submitting to Jesus. Now listen, if you're here and you're going, man, I just got to get myself cleaned up before I can fit in the church. No, the church is filled with people who trust in Jesus and we have issues, right? If you don't have issues, you don't know yourself very well, right? We've got challenges. We've got issues. The difference is we are forgiven before God. We are seen as blameless because of Christ. And that's when we know our place because of Christ. We need to make Him Lord now, listen, so, so don't, don't try to get things in order and just kind of cast out your unclean spirits and even your unclean demons and your unclean sins. Here's what I tell you to do. Here's what I tell you to do. This is what Matthew's telling us. Be captivated by this king. Be captivated by him. 
marvel at this king because it's the beauty of Christ. It's the glory of Christ. It's the wonder of Christ. You know what that does? It causes the sin in our hearts to be put to death. It causes our personal demons to never return. And it causes our souls to be so satisfied that we don't need another sign. That's the beauty of it. When Jesus' lordship and greatness take over our souls and our hearts, listen, there's no need for another sign. We don't find ourselves at the scribes and Pharisees saying, hey, Jesus, uh, I want that sign on the mantle. No, we, we, we simply are people that say, oh, the glory of amazing grace. Oh, the glory of the goodness of God found in the face of Jesus Christ. Oh, the love of God revealed to us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, the marvel of God that even though we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved over and over and over and over and over again. We keep going back to the glorious gospel. Why? Because it's the only sign we ever need. It's the only sign we'll ever need. So listen, here's my encouragement to you. Preach the gospel to yourself every day and in every way. And if you're here this morning and you're waiting for God to give you a sign that He loves you, that He cares for you, or that He's real, let's all just say it. Jesus Christ has been crucified and raised. is it. So friends, that, that gives you freedom in your gospel witness, doesn't it? Your friends are going to prove it to me. You go, well, here's my proof. I'm a sinner. God is holy. He told me I sinned against Him. I deserve the full wrath of God. He sent Jesus to die for me. I believe. God saved me. And I'm now made right before God. Would you believe too? Well, prove it to me. I'm a sinner. God is holy. God told me I'm a sinner. I deserve the full wrath of God. He sent Jesus to die for my sin. And I believe in God made me right before God and forgave me. Now, would you believe? Well, prove it. I'm a sinner. I mean, get the point. <laughs> we get the point? I know this sounds bad, but every week I'm trying to say the same thing to you every week from a different angle. Every week. I'm trying to bang one note, the same note that Martin Luther made in the Great Reformation. We are justified by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. And we're going to hear it by God's grace until the day I die, so that when I'm dead, you will remember me. That's Peter, by the way. Peter says the same thing. We've got to be people that don't need a dog and pony show. We don't need a celebrity pastor. You're not going to have one. Right? I say too many dumb things for people to be a celebrity pastor. I don't want to be one. We're not going to have that. We don't need a big light show going on. We don't need any of that. What we need is... Jesus Christ and Him crucified every week to be our touchstone, reminding us each week that's all we need. It's all we need. So when you go back in the world tomorrow, today at lunch, you want a Kentucky Fried Chicken, you're going to be confronted with, I need a sign. Well, here's your sign. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And raised from the dead is all you need. Let's pray.